Washington Journal continues. And joining us this morning from San Francisco, senior writer for Wired magazine, Tom Simonite, to talk about artificial intelligence in the workplace. Tom Simonite, what is artificial intelligence? Hi, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, that's a good question. It's one of those terms we're hearing a lot uh, lately, and, and it covers a lot of things. So in, in the broadest sense, artificial intelligence is the area of science and engineering that's all about making computers able to do um, the kind of things that humans can do. So look around at the world and make sense of it, um, solve problems for themselves, pick up new skills through experience and, and use the experience they've had in the past to solve new problems in the future. Uh, recently, one of the main ways that people build these systems is, is using a technique called machine learning. That's another term you might hear. And that's, that's really kind of simple. You basically take a bunch of example data and use that to show the software what it needs to do. Now, we've all been exposed to artificial intelligence programs in movies and TV shows that, that really are like humans and, and can you know, walk around and lead their own independent lives. And um, the reality of the technology today is, is a long way short of that. Like the systems we can build today, they can be smart, but in a very focused, narrow, narrow way. So we can build these kind of wedges of intelligence that do one thing pretty well. And um, a great example of that in everyone's pocket today is that you know, you can talk to your smartphone and it will recognize your words and transcribe them into speech. That's thanks to some recent advances in machine learning that that's very accurate now. But that system really can't do anything else. So it's, it's a very focused thing. Sometimes can recognize your voice. Sometimes, yeah, I should, yeah, that's true. And, you know, people with non-standard accents uh, certainly have problems and, and there are still lots of wrinkles to be fixed. Well, Tom Simon, when did this technology begin? How has it evolved? And what is the, what is the future? Okay, well, it, it begins a long time ago. The, the field and the term artificial intelligence uh, began in the 50s. And, um, you know, we've seen progress since then, but, you know, we're still a long way short of uh, robots that walk around by themselves. The reason we're hearing a lot about it now is that um, over the last five years, there's really been um, a rapid improvement in the power of machine learning. So this technique where you take a bunch of data and use it to train software. And that has led to some very big increases in the accuracy of speech recognition, as, as we just mentioned, and also image recognition. So uh, it's why both Google and Apple now will, will let you search your personal photos f for we're using terms like dog or tree or beach, that kind of thing. And um, so, yeah, recent improvement in those techniques has really led to um, some very impressive scientific results, some impressive kind of new business applications of the technology as well. And, and you know, out here, on the West Coast, there is a huge amount of money being invested into this technology now. And, and why? What is the hope? What is the goal of investing? And how much money are we talking about? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I mean, we're, if you add up all the big companies and the venture capitalists, I mean, you know, we're probably talking figures in the billions over the last few years. Um, I mean, just to take one example, um, Google paid around 600 million for a UK-based artificial intelligence company called DeepMind a few years ago. I mean, th th put, this is a big bet. Uh, why are they making it? I guess because computers already do so much for us, and it, it's pretty clear they could do a lot more if they were, they were smarter. And so um, there are all kinds of applications for this. Um, some of them are kind of not the kind of thing you might notice every day. I mean, just improving the targeting of advertisements would make a big difference to the bottom line of some of these big companies. Some of them are more um, transformational. And so you can think about um, work on robotics. And you know this could lead us to having drones or household robots that are smart enough to kind of navigate around the messy front room in your house or help you with the chores, that kind of thing. Um, probably most of us have been exposed to these voice assistants where you, know, you can talk to Siri or Alexa. And I'm sure we've also seen that those things are very limited. I mean, back to my earlier point, you know, we're a long way from you know, AI systems that have an independent existence. But as these things get more powerful, they're really going to allow all of us to do more in less time, I guess, and businesses to do 
more things with fewer people like you know doing the manual work and, yeah and what about that i mean what about ai in the workplace and we were as you were talking showing our viewers an image of a, a robot making a pizza i mean oh. how do we know what jobs will be replaced by artificial intelligence what are the numbers saying uh, yeah, great to bring it down to the numbers. Right now, the numbers are not suggesting uh, that you know the machines are taking jobs away f from people. This is actually a, a point of argument um, among economists and, and um, business people who, who think about this. So, uh, on the one hand, you know we are seeing the technology get more powerful, and you can certainly make the argument that that means uh, we can replace people with machines. On the other hand, if that was starting to happen, you would expect um, businesses to become, be becoming more productive because they could, could do more with technology, and, and the economic figures really don't show that. And if we look to the past, uh, there are examples where bringing in machines to, to directly replace people doesn't actually reduce employment. And, and so a good example here is uh, the ATM. Now, the ATM directly replaces people sitting behind the counter of a bank handing out your money. And yet, when they were introduced, and they were very rapidly adopted by many banks because they're extremely convenient, the number of uh, bank employees in the country went up, not down, because it freed banks to open more branches and expand their businesses in other ways. So I, I, I personally, I'm not picking a side yet. I'm staying on the fence. I think there's good reasons to think that more technology in the workplace um, doesn't have to mean fewer people. What about the other side, though? Folks like Elon Musk, who told governors at their recent gathering in Rhode Island that AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization, and I don't think people fully appreciate that. He said he has access to cutting-edge AI technology and that, based on what he's seen, AI is the scariest problem. Yeah, well, there's, Elon Musk certainly does have access to cutting-edge uh, AI technology. Uh, no one's disputing that, but there's definitely some argument about this, this point on the existential threat. Um, I, I, I wrote about um, Musk's remarks to the, the governors, and, and when I spoke to other people who work on AI and, and who spend more time on it than Elon, there, there was a, I was getting a sense of disappointment uh, because... This idea that you know at some point in the future, um, super intelligent machines w will perhaps harm humanity. I mean, that is such a long way from where we are today. You know, today we have these simple systems; they can do one thing. Um, you know, they, it's not a generalized intelligence that can take on multiple tasks. And so, um, it, it's quite hard to actually t uh, have a, a proper debate about that because it's just so far in the future. It's very speculative, and so. I spoke to researchers who not only work on AI but think about the impacts of it on society, and and they saw Musk's remarks as as kind of a missed opportunity. You know, he had a few minutes in front of some of the most powerful leaders in the U.S. to talk about this technology, which is going to potentially transform every aspect of our lives, and he he chose to direct it on this very far off future scenario, which we really, I mean, okay, we can talk about it right now, but we can't really do much, and. Um, uh, other people in the field think, you know, we should think, be thinking more now about maybe questions of employment, although Musk did mention that as well, I should, to, to give him credit. And, and questions of, you know, what about when the government is using these technologies maybe for surveillance and policing um, and other areas like that. Let's hear what our viewers have to say. Your questions and comments here on artificial intelligence in the workplace. John, Eastern North Carolina and Independent. You're up first. Yes, uh, yes. Tom. Um, back in 1996, 97, 98, I was working with a group called Spartan that worked with Blackwater, and they were all into computers part of, part of it. And we were sitting around throwing ideas around, and at that point the cloud was just the, 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 the idea of the cloud was just coming into existence. And I had a, a, a cousin that went to, had a math degree from UNC Chapel Hill, and she told me back in the late 60s when she worked for IBM that Google is just like a large number. It's, it's like the, it was a, a name that people were messing around with that were 
mathematicians that was the largest form of number that they had they had come up with with a name and we tossed around an idea about a word search algorithm that would actually take the 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 is's and a's and the small words out of a, a, a statement sentence like you'd see on a website and it would try to prioritize the uh, the most important words and then it would search for a list on what was then the cloud that would uh, actually prioritize and pull up sites and that's how Google got started. Sir, they went, these people from Spartan went to New York and there was a group of uh, programmers there about two years before Google took off and they started working on word search algorithms that would apply to the uh, what was available from the internet and Sergey Brin and uh, Elon Musk came up with well Sergey Brin and one of his partners came it up they dropped out of Stanford and they perfected the word search algorithm and that's Google and I think that I had a partial hand in naming Google thank you very much <laughs> Tom, Tom Simonite do you have any thoughts uh, John what a great story thanks for sharing it um, yeah, well, I mean, one I could just kind of riff off that is that, yeah, I mean, we think of Google as kind of solved, you know, we just, we've been using it for years now. But um, this question of how you get computers to understand language is, is one of the trickiest in this field of artificial intelligence. And so while um, search works pretty good, and so speech recognition is not bad either, translation is getting better. But um, computers still have what um, one expert described to me recently as a literacy problem. You know, they, he, he described them as illiterate. You know, they can't read a sentence or, or ingest um, a paragraph of text and, and really get a grip of the meaning of it. And um, for people that work in this field, you know, that's one of the uh, kind of questions that's hanging over, hanging over them, really, which is, you know, if we really want machines to have intelligence like us, they've got to be able to, to understand language. And how are we going to do that? And we really don't know right now. And what happened, Tom Simonite, uh, with Facebook recently and the research they were doing and um, the, the bot that they had to the program to understand language and created their own language and the controversy that surrounded that. Yes, yeah, so earlier in the month, uh, we saw a flurry of alarming headlines about some research in Facebook's artificial intelligence labs that got out of control and, and how the, the scientists there panicked and, and had to shut down, it really a kind of Hollywood imagery. And that re that really isn't what happened. The, the reality of this experiment is uh, kind of I I still think it's interesting, but it's it's not quite um, that lurid. So um, th this was research on uh, pieces of software that are called chatbots, so they can generate write simple sentences and and have a back and forth conversation with with a person or each other in a very narrow sense. And they were created and programmed to do one specific thing, which was play this uh, game where you have to negotiate with your uh, a, another person, a partner, and trade certain items, hats and, and books and balls. And um, this was a test of a, a machine learning idea. And so these chatbots could play this simple game and you know, come up with sentences like, I'll swap two books for one ball. And they could experiment a little bit. Or they could just like randomly try things and then and see what worked. And then if something worked, they would do it more. And um, initially, they had two of these programs play with each other. And they were experimenting back and forth and playing this game. And then they started to write, come up with sentences that didn't make sense. They, they just kind of repeated the same word over and over. They were just kind of garbage, really. And, um, and that wasn't scary. That was actually. A failure. Like the experiment had, had just hadn't worked at that point, and so uh, well, they realized that they programmed these things to play the game, but they hadn't, you know, coded in there a restriction saying, "By the way, you need to use proper sentences." And uh, when they put that in, these things did learn to play the game, and they could actually play with humans, um, which was kind of neat. I mean, they can play this one particular game; they can't play any other game, but but that worked. And so, where the misconception came in, I. In, in some media outlets was that um, this kind of initial, initial failure of the experiment was, was kind of cast as like this kind of creepy, ac uh, kind of almost malevolent accident. And, and that, that really isn't what happened. William in Buffalo, New York, a Republican. Good morning. Your question or comment? Good morning. Um, I guess where I'm coming from might seem like a bit of a curveball for you because it's similar to as you were discussing what the side effects are on the general populace. We saw what 
innovations did to the blue collar sector about 30, 40 years ago and that had a generational effect hollowing out communities. Now we see technologies coming into the white collar sector. Even I'm sure you're well aware as a right that there is software that can write write articles for you. We've seen it with baseball sets and things of that nature. But on not a bad sci fi movie angle where you know, we just have droves in negative situations. Um, in more of a positive approach to this since Yes, this is coming. It can all be very good for humanity, to, utilizing these things to do things for us. How, from your perspective, can you see us as a people actually utilizing this to our advantage and not having droves of surplus population we have to figure out what to do with? Yeah, really important issues, William. And um, I, um, I have to tell you, I don't have a great solution <laughs> for you. But, um, yeah, you're right. I, I think... You know, we as a society do need to engage with this, and in some ways we're already behind on engaging with previous technological shifts in how the economy works. Um, I think some people will probably tell you that this shift with software becoming smarter and much more flexible is happening faster, and so, you know, maybe that raises the stakes even more. Um, uh, but I think you do see in countries around the world that governments and policymakers are engaging more uh, in this topic. Um, towards the end of the Obama administration, the White House organized a series of big workshops around the country where policymakers and experts in AI technology came together and discussed all kinds of things. Um, you know, the effect on employment was definitely one of them, um, you know, policing and all these other things. And so, um, yeah, I think we need to engage with this as much as possible and, uh, and you know, think about it at every level. We'll go to Jack next, who's in Fort Worth, Texas, a Democrat. Hi. Hey, uh, I wanted to compliment you on the article that y'all had last week on uh, DARPA that wants to build a BS detector for science. I thought that was uh, a very necessary step in what I see as a, as a way to kind of clear out this fake news and, and kind of clean up uh the sources of information. And I'd like to tie that to another project that I hope is under uh, planned, and that's to use AI system to validate our climate science. Uh, there's so much debate uh, and rancor over consensus and what is the effect of, of humans on, on the planet's uh, biosphere. I think AI would play a crucial role in helping us clear out all the uh, skeptical fake arguments that I, I see proliferate around the web. Okay, Tom uh, Simonite. Yeah, Jack, thanks very much. Um, yes, that article written by my colleague Adam Rogers about a project of DARPA. DARPA is the uh, advanced research group of the Pentagon. They're looking into this idea of having... AI systems that can kind of detect uh, anomalies in sci scientific data, you know, w w arguments that are incorrect. And they're particularly interested in um, using that on uh, scientific information about kind of social trends and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think there's, pro there's kind of good news and, ba and bad news on this, on this point you raise. So the good news is it's becoming very clear that AI is going to be a great help to scientists, and we're, we're already seeing that, you know. Um, systems that can kind of learn about the structure of molecules and, and even generate new ones. I, I wrote about some research last year where, you know, a scientist could go to a program and say, okay, well, I want something that's kind of halfway between, um, I don't know, aspirin and paracetamol, and it would use its understanding of chemistry to say, well, how, we could try this. I mean, I, th I think that's going to accelerate the development of new medicines. Um, the bad news is that I, well, it's not really bad news. I mean, it's just the reality that I don't think we can... Um, assume that everyone is going to agree with what these systems come up with. And so, you know, just because I create a piece of software that analyzes a bunch of information and says, look, this is the way we should interpret it, I, you know, human nature being what it is, I'm sure there will still be plenty of people that disagree. And so, um, you know, ending the debate about climate science, I, th I think that's on us, not on the computers, if you see what I mean. 
Ringwood, New Jersey. Steve is watching there on our line for Republicans. You're on the air. Yes, thank you for, uh, for receiving my call. Uh, I'm an accounting instructor. I'm also a CPA. I've been an accounting instructor for about 20 years at a state university. And uh, I've, I've found in the educational form that there's definitely an over-dependence on uh, artificial intelligence, especially the computer, uh, the cell phone. Uh, I think it creates uh, more of a one-dimensional lifestyle. And also, I think that from a student standpoint, it, has, it creates a tendency for students not to utilize their long-term permanent memory. Uh, let me give you an example. I'm just thinking of one class that I, that I teach normally every semester. In the class, I teach annuity formulas in, uh, in let's say, an intermediate accounting class. And uh, I find a tendency is for students to immediately go to their cell phone to put the annuity formula into the cell phone instead of into their long-term permanent memory. And uh, since that time, I've, I've really disallowed cell phones and computers into the classroom because I feel like the students aren't utilizing their, their brain, basically. They're, they're overly dependent upon some one-dimensional screen to store everything for them. And I think that that's a dangerous way for society to, to become. Okay, Steve. We... Tom Simonite, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, a, a really interesting issue. I mean, I think uh, by now we have a lot of evidence that, you know, well, Humans are easily distracted, and um, smartphones and things like that, you know, do distract us, distract us easily. And I, I believe there's also research out there that you know shows people ha do rely less on memorizing facts now they know they can turn to Google. I guess the question is, you know, are there situations in which that's harmful? I mean, it certainly sounds like the classroom <laughs> might be one of them. But, but also, you know, maybe maybe if your brain isn't uh, devoting energy to storing facts, ho hopefully we could use it for something else. Like maybe you develop your uh, abstract reasoning powers more, all that kind of thing. I mean, it's certainly something to think about. And this question of how uh, humans and machines work together is a very um, important one, and it's one that's being investigated more and more by academic researchers and in industry as well. So just last month, in fact, Google spun up a new research initiative around trying to understand how humans and AI systems can work together. So. Um, yeah, it's a big question. I think it's great that more companies and researchers are now working on it, and hopefully uh, we can figure out some answers that allow us to um, continue to you know, develop our full potential, but also get the benefits of this technology. We'll go to Lee in Arab, Alabama, Independent. Yes, uh, I had the, uh, software, uh, the uh, software configuration management organization uh, in uh, Red, at Redstone Arsenal with the software engineering directorate. And Dr. Minsky of MIT had taken leave and was teaching an artificial intelligence course at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And I took that course, and he talked about a uh, program that he had designed that was called POGO. And he this would answer any kind of a mathematical problem uh, and and he had taken uh, kids in Boston that were considered uh, illiterate in math and they took his artificial intelligence pogo and they were able to advance in math way ahead of any average student in uh, the Boston school area. And I just wonder what happened to Dr. Minsky and his studies in uh, artificial intelligence. Maybe you know. Yeah, so Marvin Minsky, a, um, an incredible scientist, uh, boasted at MIT for most of his life and really a pioneer in the field. He died, I believe, in 2015 or maybe last year. Anyway, he, he, I mean, he, but he continues to exert a huge influence on the field today. I mean, he, he laid the groundwork for a lot of the work that goes on today and, it, you know, frequently rec referenced in new work. And um, that work on education is, is very interesting and, and certainly, you know, that's kind of a, a torch being carried forward by people in the AI community today. You know, uh, I think most of us can understand how having a personalized uh, kind of educational program developed for you by a one-on-one -on -one tutor would 
would be ideal. You know, the nature of the world is that not everyone can have that. But if um, uh, software is involved in, in assessing your work or monitoring your work, uh, you, can, you can generate that kind of personalized material uh, for every student. And, and there are certainly companies uh, looking at that and I, I think some promising results. We have a couple minutes left here. Susan in Richardson, Texas, Republican. Thank you. I've been reading a lot lately about quantum computing, which is, of course, revolutionizing how we think about reality. And I'm a non-technical person, but it's really a very simple concept. Uh, apparently, IBM and other businesses have been working on this for years. And uh, what I'm wondering is why aren't more people delving into this uh, everywhere? For example, when I put uh, the word Elon Musk and, and uh, paired it with the word quantum computing on Google, nothing came up. Tom Simonite? Yeah, uh, quantum computing is something I uh, write about fairly frequently. And uh, so very briefly, um, at very small scales, you know, smaller than an atom, uh, you, quantum physics becomes very important in understanding how um, physical matter operates. And, and weird stuff can happen. And if you, you can exploit that to, to create a new kind of computer, which the theory says would be incredibly powerful, many, many more times powerful than the supercomputers we have today. And there is indeed, as Susan says, a lot of activity and interest incredibly powerful, many, many more times powerful than the supercomputers we have today. And there is indeed, as Susan says, a lot of activity and interest in this. And so uh, the US government, um, in both civilian and military ways, has been inv investigating this for a long time. IBM is, is one of the pioneers. Google um, has built out a lab in Santa Barbara in California to work on this as well. And, and there are startups too in the Bay Area. Um, the, the quantum computers that have been built so far are, are pretty simple. They're not really very useful right now, but the basic principles are being proved out. The theory is holding up. And so over the next five to 10 years, I, th I think you know, we, we could see these things start to be very useful. And, and uh, artificial intelligence is one of the uses we will see them uh, put to, which will be very interesting. I mean, it has the potential to maybe allow some kind of big jumps forward in, in what machines can do. Let's get in one last call. Mary in California, Democrat. Mary, you're on the air. Oh, hi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greta. And thank you, uh, dear Lord, for C-SPAN, Washington Journal. It's kind of been a rough morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I was just going to ask um, uh, Tom if, if AI can help um, in some future time people with Alzheimer's, if we don't find a a cure for it. I mean, if there can be a download of our of our brain and and our thoughts and memories, or our, that we want to keep, that that could a chip could help us. I'm 68, and I'm thinking about things. And with Glenn Campbell just passing away with Alzheimer's, um, it's a shame. It's I mean, it's I hate the disease more than cancer. It's just doesn't okay. give you a chance. Mary, we'll, we'll take that question. Tom Simonite. Yeah, thanks, Mary. And that's a, it's a very good question, and you kind of led us into an interesting area. So there is um, growing interest in, in directly connecting computers with the brain. And uh, work that's been done on that so far has shown that you, know, you can do it. There are people who have um, become paralyzed who regain control of they can control a robotic arm using this uh, thing that plugs into their brain uh, and, and things like that. And there is interest, you know, in the long term, it's, it's very unclear how we would do it, but um, building chips that would connect with your brain and enhance perhaps your memory or, or other faculties. So, you know, it's not pure fantasy. Uh, people are thinking about it, people are working on it. Um, that name, Elon Musk, comes up again and again. He, he has a company called Neuralink, which is, is working on some ideas in this technology. And uh, the Pentagon is also funding a lot of research. W one of their motivations is um, injured soldiers, you know, wanting them to, to regain control of, of limbs they've lost, perhaps, or, or giving them um, control of robotic assistance devices, that kind of thing. So um, I think progress on that is going to be really quite slow. It's very hard to connect a computer to the brain. You know, you have to cut through the skull and all these kind of things. There are issues of um, 
making things compatible with the human body um, that need to be figured out. But um, in the long term, I think, you know, there's a feeling that, yeah, it could be possible. If you want to follow more of Tom Simonite's reporting on artificial intelligence, you can go to Wired.com or follow him on Twitter at Wired or at T. Simonite, senior writer with the magazine. We appreciate the conversations.